Hey everybody, it's Pastor Josh here at St. Michael, and I'm coming to you from my office with the Bible study on the first two commandments. Now I'm coming to you from my office not because we didn't have Bible study on Wednesday, because we did, and we sent it out via Zoom, but somehow I forgot to record it as well. So for the people that I promised I would send a recording to, I am re-recording this in a slightly condensed version so that you have an opportunity to see it too. Um, it won't be quite as in-depth as it was last night just because there's not as many, There's well, there's no people here with me. Um, so there's nobody here to ask questions. But I have taken some of the questions I got last night and incorporated them into what we're going to talk about. So maybe you'll get the whole thing. Um, please remember that next week we have a healing service in place of the Bible study. I will be putting a video up and sending it out sometime in the next week that explains what a healing service is so you know what you're getting into. I promise no Benny Hinn stuff. Nobody's going to be falling out. Um, and then the week after that, we will resume with the Ten Commandments. That'll be the Third and Fourth Commandment. So um, as you're going through this, um, please take time to do the reading. Uh, that Bible study that we have on the Small Catechism is, is quite good. Um, it's a little old, but that's, that's okay. Um, it's actually still very relevant, and so please try to use that if you can. Um, and if you find the Praying the Small Catechism handouts that I was giving you useful, let me know and I'll keep doing that for you. Um, some people use them, some people don't. I don't want to waste paper. So if you'd like them, let me know. So why don't we go ahead and get started talking about the Ten Commandments. And we're just going to do a brief introduction to them and then we'll get into the nitty gritty of the First and Second Commandment because that's where a lot of our material lies tonight. Today, I guess for me. So... When we think about the Ten Commandments, the thing we think of is these laws that are handed down by God that we're supposed to abide by. Like they're the, the top ten laws, right? Um, and we have this mental image of Moses going up Mount Sinai and getting these commandments on these stone tablets. And he comes back down the mountain and he sees all the people down there with their new golden calf. And he gets upset breaks the commandments, has to go back up and get new commandments and start all over again, right? So so people say Moses was the first commandment breaker because he broke the stone tablets. Keep that image in your head, that image in your head, but remember that's not quite how it happened. And we're going to talk about that as we get into this. So the commandments are given to us in two specific places, but they they're echoed throughout scripture. The first place we see him is in Exodus 20, which is where we're going to look at tonight. And this is the listing of the commandments at Mount Sinai. The second time comes in the book of Deuteronomy. And the book of Deuteronomy is essentially Moses giving a sermon just before he dies, just before the people go into the promised land. And what he's doing is he's trying to explain to them, you know, I'm not coming into the promised land with you. God has told me that I'm not allowed. I'm going to die before you go in. So these are all the things that you've learned over these last 40 years. These are all the important things God wants you to know. These are the things that you need to remember so that you can go into the promised land and live as God's faithful people. So the whole book is supposed to be a reminder for them as they leave his leadership as he dies and enter the promised land under Joshua of how they're supposed to live as God's faithful people. We'll see in later Bible studies that they don't do a very good job of that, but that's neither here nor there. That's why they're in Deuteronomy. It's a repeat of what they learned in the 40 years. So depending on what kind of Christian you are, you probably number these commandments differently. And that probably seems a little confusing. Why would we do that? Well, it's because we as Christians have a hard time getting along and agreeing on things. So when Luther came along, he looked at the commandments and he didn't like the way they were numbered. So they got reordered. Um, we say that the first commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me. And that the second commandment is that you shall not take the Lord's name in vain. Some of our other Christian brethren, such as the Catholics, will say that the first commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me. The second commandment is you shall not make an idol or graven image for yourself. That's why if you go into an Orthodox church, you will not see any graven images 
of God or angels or anything like that. You will see paintings on the wall, what are called icons. Um, I actually have a couple here in my office. They're, they're literally written instead of drawn, but they are flat paintings. And that's acceptable because it's not a graven image. But they take that commandment very seriously. And that's why throughout the history of Protestantism and, and Christianity, we've had these periods called iconoclasm, where people suddenly remember that part of the commandment, whether they think it's the part of the first or the second standalone commandment, and they start breaking images. They start breaking statues and stuff like that. When Luther was in hiding after they had issued an arrest warrant for him, um, a gentleman came into the city of Wittenberg and started breaking statues and tearing up all the beautiful cathedrals. And Luther had to come out of hiding and stop him at the risk of his own life because he was destroying the churches in an iconoclastic fit. So these renumberings can sometimes cause a lot of issues. Um, the catechism that I gave you last week, the small catechism, Luther wrote that, as we discussed, and so the commandments are ordered in there according to his ordering and his explanations. And you'll see, if you look in your small catechism, that it says, um, or at least the, the full version says, the Ten Commandments in a simple way in which the head of a house is to present them to the household. So Luther made sure to present these very simply. Okay. Meanwhile, in the book of Concord, this big book, the Lutheran Confessions, Luther wrote the large catechism, which is the basically the handbook for pastors and for teachers of the church. It is much bigger than the small catechism. The first commandment gets 15 pages, and the second commandment gets 13 pages. Um, and that's because Luther really expanded on them for pastors and for teachers to understand them a little bit better. And if you're interested in seeing that, you can come by my office. I have a copy of the book here. We also have a copy of the church, which is the tappet version. It's a little older, but it's still good. Um, if you're really interested in that. I, I didn't think it would be a good idea to go through the large catechism with you. I thought you might revolt. It's a bit long. So, all that is to say, um, we have different orderings and we have different ideas when it comes to how the commandments were given. But Scripture has its own ideas. So let's read what Scripture has to say. To get you the whole story, I'm going to go back to start at Exodus 19 verse 1 and go through the giving of the commandments. Um, I am using the NRSV because that is what we typically use, the Bible translation we typically use in the ELCA. But um, if you have a King James or an NIV or NASB or NET, there's a lot of different translations out there. Most of them are very good. Um, if you have a question about it, ask me. I, I've had to work through all this stuff for seminary, so I can tell you if it's a, a, a good faithful translation or a little questionable. So, okay, Exodus 19, verses 1. On the third new moon, after the Israelites had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They had journeyed from Rephidim, entered the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. Israel camped there in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the Israelites, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all peoples. Indeed, the whole world, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. So Moses came, summoned the elders of the people, and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. The people all answered as one, Everything that the Lord has spoken we will do. Hang on to that thought. Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to come to you in a dense cloud, in order that the people may hear when I speak with you, and so trust you ever after. When Moses had told the words of the people to the Lord, the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. 
Have them wash their clothes and prepare for the third day, because on the third day the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. You shall set limits for the people all around, saying, Be careful not to go up to the mountain or to touch the edge of it. Any who touch the mountain shall be put to death. No hand shall touch them, but they shall be stoned or shot with arrows. Whether animal or human being, they shall not live. When the trumpet sounds a long blast, they may go up on the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people. He consecrated the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said to the people, Prepare for the third day. Do not go near a woman. On the morning of the third day there was thunder and lightning, as well as thick cloud on the mountain, and a blast of trumpets so loud that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. They took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended upon it in fire. The smoke went up like the smoke of a kiln, while the whole mountain shook violently. As the blast of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses would speak and God would answer him in thunder. When the Lord descended upon Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, the Lord summoned Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went up. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people not to break through to the Lord to look, otherwise many of them will perish. Even the priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves, or the Lord will break out against them. Moses said to the Lord, The people are not permitted to come up to Mount Sinai, for you yourself warned us, saying, Set limits around the mountain and keep it holy. The Lord said to him, Go down and come up, bringing Aaron with you. But do not let either the priest or the people break through to come up to the Lord, otherwise he will break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. Then the Lord spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord, am a jealous God. Punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When all the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moses, You speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. For God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you, so that you do not sin. Then the people stood at a distance, while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. Here ends the reading. So there's a lot going on there. Okay, When they first get to the mountain, the people are all gung-ho. They, they want to be there. They've been led out by the presence of God from Egypt. They are excited to be there. And so they say, all these things that the Lord has said, we will do, no problem. We'll get consecrated. We'll do all of that. And then the day that the Lord descends comes. And there's this fire and smoke and thunder and earthquakes and trumpet blasts from places nobody can see. And it looks basically like the end of the world. And suddenly they're told, come here. And their response to that is like, you know what? Thanks. Um, Moses, you go. And you talk to God, and we'll sit here, and when you find out what God wants, then you come back and talk to us. So it's a very different scene than what we grew up thinking about, you know, gray beard Moses going up the mountain and getting the Ten Commandments. That's not how it happened. 
God called out these commandments in the sight and sound and hearing of all the people. These were commandments given to them not just stenciled on some stone tablets and handed down and then having to be done again. No, these were given to the people in person by God. And they were scared. You would think scared enough to listen to what had happened and what had been said and obey them, but they get carried away, as we'll see later. So, when we look at the Ten Commandments, as we just read them, You'll notice that they're breaking they're broken into two categories. The first three, which is you shall have no other gods before me, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, and you shall honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Those three deal with our response to God, how we respond back to what God is doing. Okay? It's our direct relationship with God. The next seven commandments that we'll address later. All of those have to do with how we treat our neighbors. Okay? So this goes back to uh, essentially what Jesus was saying. That the, the sum of the law and, and all things, the Torah, are summed up in the sentence, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. That's the first three commandments. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's the last seven commandments. If we do those two things then we are living as God has called us to live. But even though they seem like relatively simple sentences, even in the Bible, even more so in what Luther put into the small catechism, the implications of each one is much more complicated. And that's why we're breaking them down as we are and doing just two a week. Because as you'll see, there is so much to learn and so much to talk about in them that you can't just take them all at one time. You wouldn't learn the meaning of them. So let's get started with the first commandment. Now the first commandment as it's written in Exodus 20 is, Then God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall, not make your, you shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents, to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but show instead fast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments." One of the most important parts of this, and this is where I get excited because we get to talk about Hebrew, is the way that God reveals and talks to the people. God starts out with a Hebrew phrase that I know all of you can read without my help, right? All of you are Hebrew scholars. Well, I'm going to help you, okay? So, this is... Anoki Adonai Elohika. Anoki Adonai Elohika. What it literally translates to is, I am the Lord your God. Okay, this isn't just a statement. This is God saying, of all the peoples in this world, of all the people I could have shown myself to, you are mine. I am naming you. I am claiming you. I am marking you. You are mine. I am the Lord your God. There are no other gods. There are no other gods who can come before me. I am the Lord your God. And you are mine. This is really important. Because without this without this very first thing we have no way of having a relationship with God the only reason we're able to is because God chose to have a relationship with us which is crazy if you think about it it doesn't make any sense why would the God who created the entire world 
who created you and me and all the things that we have, the computer, the knowledge to make the computer you have, Mother Nature outside, everything. Why would a God who did all of that need to have a relationship with us finite beings? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense, does it? But that's the point. The things that God does don't have to make sense to us. The reality is that we have been called and marked by God and named as God's people. We have been called out. We are His. And I use His hesitantly. You notice that I try to substitute the word God for a, a masculine or feminine pronoun. There's nothing wrong with saying His or Her. Um, it's perfectly acceptable to do that either way. And we have the Trinitarian formula like God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But the reason I tend to say God instead of him or her is because God is much more than a him or her. God is God and something that we cannot fully understand. The reason we hear he a lot in scripture is because the default pronoun for divine things in Hebrew is masculine. So anything divine is going to be called he any kind of God or anything like that. Just like anything that relates to the earth is going to be called she in Hebrew. So it's the only two pronouns they have, he or she. There's no neuter. In Greek, it's pretty similar. In Greek, you have he and you have she. You do have a neuter pronoun, but most of the writers in Scripture stayed away, and I think wisely, from calling God it. That just sounds a little weird. But you'll notice that I say God, God's self, or something like that, just because it's more inclusive as far as I'm looking at things. Um, there's nothing wrong with it either way, just so long as we realize that God is bigger than our definitions of gender and we don't get hung up there. Sorry, that's a sidebar. I'll throw my soapbox out now. Okay, so let's look at the small catechism. Let's look at Luther's explanation of the commandment we just read. Now, according to Luther, the commandment is simple. You are to have no other gods. And Luther says, what does this mean? It means that we are to fear, love, and trust God above all things. Which sounds easy, right? Well, maybe. So what does it mean to fear God? You know, is it to be scared of God like the Israelites were when he was pounding, when God was pounding the mountain and, and there was lightning and everything? You know, or does fear mean to respect God and to to do what God says because God, like your father or like your mother or like somebody important in your life, has a place of respect and you, you honor that? Or does fear mean that you stand completely mind blown that this God would even want to have anything to do with you, that this God would even be descending upon a mountain to give you these commandments. I think the reality is all of those things encompass fear in one way or another. Fear, in this sense, basically means to stand in awe of God, to be so amazed that you can't help but worship. It's the What's standing before you is so holy, so divine, the fact that you have been called by name, that God has said, I am the Lord your God, changes you so completely that you can't help but worship and stand in awe. So then, if that's what awe means, what about love? Well, love gets a little bit trickier, right? So with love, we should respond in faith. But then we have to look at the world we live in. Okay, let's be honest. The world we have around us, it can be kind of crappy sometimes, right? There are people out there who do bad things. They hurt other people. We sometimes hurt other people and sometimes not even meaning to, you know? It might be as simple as not wearing your mask when you're supposed to to prevent other people from getting whatever germs you might have. That's a serious thing and that is a love your neighbor kind of issue. Anytime we talk about love, we also have to acknowledge the fact that we live in a world that doesn't recognize love as much as it should. 
God recognizes that too. God's not expecting us to love God and stick our head in a hole in the ground and just pretend like everything's great all the time. Because it's not, and God knows that. What God means by love is that you trust God above all things. You look to God for your salvation. You know that at the end of the day, whatever this world has to throw at us is not the end of our story. And it all comes down because God came to our earth in person as Jesus Christ died on the cross and saved us from our sins. And so, death is not the end. Yes, bad things are going to happen. But we can love God. We can trust that God is going to take us through one way or the other, even if there's some suffering involved. At the end of the day, things are going to be okay. And in the middle, we work to try to make things better. So that's where love comes in. The last part of it, though, is trust. And Martin Luther has a very simple sentence in the large catechism that I have identified with quite strongly over the years. Luther says that whatever you have that you're willing to put your trust in, that you're willing to make sure will see you through, that has become your God. This commandment calls us to put our trust above all in God. So if we're sitting there thinking, okay, we've got enough money to get through, then we've made money our God. Mammon, which is in the RSV, is the, the old God of money and such. If we think that, you know, we have enough resources to take care of ourselves, that we don't need anybody else, we've made those things, those possessions, those properties, our God. I even had a professor in, in, in seminary who would say that, you know, think of the first thing you'd grab in a fire. Whatever it is, that's what happens. We let possessions come between us. This commandment is a reminder that we should always put our utmost trust in God because God is the only one that can get us through. God will provide whatever it is we need whether it's money or food or whatever it is. But ultimately, God will provide, even through the hardships, eternal life. So, God is the Lord our God. God has made us God's own, has called us, has identified as God, us as God's people, and draws us closer to God. What we're supposed to do in response is to fear, love, and trust in God above all things and trust that God will get us through no matter what. So, there is a scripture passage that I want to read because I want you to see how this flows all throughout scripture. And this is Romans 8.28. And most people know this one pretty well. It's fairly common in funerals. So, Romans 8, 28 through 39. Yeah. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that, they may, that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also, sticky note the way, justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? 
Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sore? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither life, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The biggest reason I share that particular one is because it shows very clearly, even all the way through to the New Testament, how important the fact that God, how important it is the fact that God is our God, that God has called us and said, I am the Lord, your God. And that love shines through in everything God does, even sending Jesus to be with us. Nothing can separate us from that love. Nothing can separate us from God because we have been named and marked by God as God's own. So like I said, it might be a simple sentence in Scripture, but even with just the first commandment, there's a lot there. There's even more that we can talk about, but we need to move on to the second commandment before you turn this video off. So... Let's read the second commandment. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Now, to expand on that, we're going to go back a little bit. We're going to look at Exodus 3, um, verses 1 through 15. And once I read it, I'll explain where we're going with this. So Exodus 3, Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. This mountain is also known as Sinai. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The God, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. So there's two reasons we go back and look at that. The first reason is because 
I just wanted to talk for a minute about the way God calls people. So here's Moses. He's minding his own business. Of course, we know his past. He's escaped from Egypt after being a murderer. He's gone and got married. He's tending a flock out in the wilderness. And as he's walking along, here's this burning bush. Now, that would be strange enough in a desert because you would think that it would burn up quickly and spread to other things. But it's not. So Moses decides to turn aside. And he gets into this conversation with the bush, who turns out to be God. And God tells him, you're going to go to Egypt and free my people. Which is, you can imagine, exactly where Moses wanted to go. And so he says, you know, who am I? And God tells him that the sign that he is the right person, that he has been sent by God, is that when he goes and does what God tells him to do and gets the people out of Egypt and brings them back, they'll worship God on the mountain. Essentially, God pulled out the, you do what I say, and when you're done, you'll know it was me defense. That's, that's how God calls us. You know, it's not... In our lives, we love to see these simple things, these you know, well-laid-out paths and these, these clear directions and waypoints, and that way we know we're on the right path. And we like that for our own, our own human needs. But that's not how God works. God doesn't give us those clear little waypoints and stuff like that. God says, you go do what I say, and when you come back, you know you did right. And sure enough, Moses does. And it's hard. But they do come back, and they do end up worshiping on that mountain, which is where God gives us the Ten Commandments. So, it worked out, right? Just something for you to kind of file away that, you know, when God is calling you, it's not necessarily going to be the straight, easy path and well laid out before you. It can be a lot more complicated than that. The second thing, and this means more Hebrew, I'm sure you're all excited is in this passage, we find out God's name. Now, you might be thinking, eh, you know, that's not a big deal, but I'm going to explain why it is. So, this is known as the Tetragrammaton, okay? Four letters. Now, you will hear people try to pronounce this, but it has intentionally been made in Scripture to be unpronounceable. Okay, You will hear people say that God's name is Yahweh or Jehovah. And that's because they tried to take God's name here and put some vowel points to it and try to say it. But that doesn't mean they got it right. Because we don't know exactly how to pronounce God's name. And that's for a reason. There were these people a long time ago who were worried that the Hebrew language would die out. So they went through and added these vowel points that help us pronounce Hebrew, right? But the vowel points that have been added for this word don't make sense. Because of the vowel points for another word, the word Adonai, which means the Lord. Somewhere along the line, somebody realized that humans are pretty sinful. And that we mess up even the simplest things. So... They made sure that we wouldn't know how to pronounce this right because there was no way that we could pronounce it in a way that wasn't going to besmirch it, to dirty it with our sinful ways. So we don't know how to say exactly that, but we know how to say the substitute, which is Lord or God, right? Okay, so the reason that that's important is because we know what it means. We don't know how to say it, but we know what it means. Because God tells us in this passage, I am who I am. I will be who I will be. I am going to be who I am going to be. God is the happening one. And I know that sounds weird, but it means there's always something happening, always something new, always something going on. God is eternal and ever moving. God is the happening one. And it shortens down to I am. Okay, and we'll pick that back up towards the end. When God gave Moses God's name, when God gave Moses those letters, God limited God's self to some degree, a very minuscule degree. 
But God gave humans the ability to call on God, to utter God's name, even if it's a substitute for what the divine name actually is, to utter God's name and to enter into a prayer language with God. Because that's what you're doing. When you call on God, when you say, O oh Lord God, or when you say, Gracious God, whether it's the beautiful flowing language that we have in our liturgy that we use every Sunday that I am a huge fan of, or it's just the simple prayer that you utter in your sleep before, before you fall asleep in your bed at night. When you call on God's name, you've been given that ability by the Lord who is your God, who has marked you and named you and called you, and you are entering into a conversation with God. And that's why the second commandment becomes so important. So Luther's explanation for the second commandment, you are not to take the name of your God in vain, is that we are to fear and love God so that we do not curse, swear, practice magic, lie or deceive using God's name, but instead use that very name in every time of need to call on, pray to, praise and give thanks to God. So let's disbunk a notion here people will tell you that this means you're not allowed to curse that's not true okay now that doesn't mean you should because society has decided that for polite conversation curse words are not usually acceptable so i don't think you should show up at church and start you know dropping s-bombs and everything else but that is a societal decision. That is not something that God has said we shouldn't do. What God says we shouldn't do is using the divine name, the name that we call on to enter into prayer with God. We should not use that in vain, which means it's all about intent. We shouldn't use God's name if we're not intending to call on God to answer a need. Now, that doesn't mean you can't call on God when you're sad or when you're upset or when you're angry because we see that all through Scripture. I mean, you think about it. The book of Lamentations is an entire book of people yelling at God. Most of the Psalms are Psalms of lament, and they are essentially the same thing. God, why are you doing this to me? God, why do you have you forsaken me? God, what did I do to you? Just kill me, whatever you got to do. It's a lot, right? We should never use God's name if we're not actually calling out to God. If we're not entering into some kind of prayer, whether it's a prayer of lament or a prayer of anger or a prayer of fear, it needs to be a legitimate it needs to be a legitimate cause. You need to be calling out to God for a reason. Just throwing out God's name like, oh God, and not doing anything with that, just using it out of frustration. It's not the right way to go. And when you realize that God limited God's self to give us that name, to help us enter into a language with God, then now you understand why it's so important to make sure you're paying attention to that commandment. Okay, Not that you're justified by the law or anything like that, but because God has loved you so much, you should want to keep that commandment. It's important. It's very important. We shouldn't just be throwing away the name of the person who created the God, who created all of us, who created this entire world. We should have respect for it. I think that's part of the reason why we have issues nowadays, because God's name, the faith has been so cheapened that it doesn't mean much to people anymore. And the only way we're going to recapture that is if we put some reverence back in our faith. That starts here. So, let's see. Let's look at Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Because that does the best job of any passage I can think of in describing this. And it also happens to be arguably my favorite passage in all of Scripture. So this is a letter from Paul to the people of Philippi, the church of Philippi. And uh, the section we're going to read is probably 
part of an ancient Christian hymn, but we're not 100% sure. It probably is. So, Philippians 2, 5-11. through 11. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The name that God gave Jesus is God's name. It's the Lord. This is an incredibly important thing for us to remember. God's love can never be taken from us, of course. But because we have God's sacred name and we can call out to God, our relationship with God can never be taken either. So make sure that as you're building that relationship, which is the practice of years, faith is not a, a sudden thing. Faith is a journey. Make sure as you're building that relationship that you are listening and honoring God in as best a way you can at that time so that you are in true faith with God. Now, I said we would come back to the idea of I am, and that's the last thing we'll, we'll cover before I end this video. Um, you'll remember that, in especially in the Gospel of John, Jesus makes a lot of these what are called I am statements. In Greek, it is... Hey, we did two languages today. In Greek, it is ego a me. So, ego a me. Sorry, camera's backwards for me. Um, essentially the same thing as God's name. I am. I am I am who I am. I am the happening one. I am. There's one particular scene in John where Jesus is having a controversy with the crowds around him, which seemed to happen a lot. And he's telling them that um, before Moses, before all their ancestors, he says, I am. And the crowd has a very bad reaction to it. Well, this section of scripture and this commandment helps us understand why. Because when he says those words, in Greek it would be ego eimi, I am, he is calling on God's divine name. He is saying that he has connection with God. He is saying that he is a part of God. And to the crowd, that's a violation of a commandment. That's blasphemy of the Lord's sacred name. And so the penalty for that is death. And so they start picking up rocks to take care of it. So if you've ever been confused about why people got so upset when Jesus just said, I am, that's why. It's because Jesus was using God's holy name. Jesus was identifying himself with God, which is the same thing our Philippians, chapter, our Philippians reading was saying. God gave Jesus that name and made sure that everyone knew that Jesus was Lord. Jesus was worthy of the divine name because Jesus was God. So like I said, when we started this whole thing now almost 50 minutes ago, these commandments are really short in Scripture, even shorter in the small catechism. But the implications for them are vast. There are so many things that we can talk about with them. You know, so if you take away nothing else from tonight or whenever you're watching this video, bear in mind these two things for the first two commandments. First, God loves you and God has identified you as God's. God has said, I am the Lord, your God. There are no other gods. We are his. We are God's. For the second commandment, God has given us God's name so that we can enter into prayer with God, into communion with God, to have a relationship with God. 
we should not want to ever abuse that relationship. Because a name is an important thing. Having somebody know your name gives them some measure of control over you. They know things about you. God willingly gave up that part of God's identity so that we could have that relationship. So let's not abuse it. Those are the two most important things to take away from this. So, I hope you enjoyed going through this. It wasn't quite the way it was when I did it with the group last night. Um, I'm hoping that the next time we do this, I remember to press record so we don't have to re-record it. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to give me a call or send me an email here at the church. I love to talk to you. You know, that's what I'm here for, and I love talking about this stuff. I get way more excited about Hebrew and Greek and and biblical exegesis than I ever actually should. But, you know, if you want to open that can of worms, I'm willing to talk to you. Thank you all for watching. I hope you have a good rest of your week. Please stay safe. Wear your mask. And I will see you next week at our healing service. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.